Oh, sure, Lord. You're very welcome. Thank you. How are you well? Good, good. Well, delighted to have you. Thanks for coming down. How are you? Nice to meet you. You too. Gurum Aigav agus ta fáilte mór róg a chalan a cathrach an iúd an cailriú sió agus sílim gur a bheith sin an fágal ciart den méid a tamaí an iúd cailriú cailriú síol agus cailriú obair Padraig Fig. In typical Freddy the Thirteenth fashion, they had a problem with the microphones, but they seem to have sorted it. So hopefully that isn't an omen for the rest of today. But such is the poetry of life, I suppose. I have to say, uh, I won't keep you very, very long because uh, today is certainly not about uh, me getting up and you having to listen to me. But the reason we're here uh, is just sat there front and center. Uh, the man himself is here with us today and we're delighted uh, that he has been able uh, to join with us uh, this afternoon for this recognition and also this celebration, celebration uh, of your birthday, uh, but also a celebration of your contribution uh, to this city. And I think it's important and we don't always get enough opportunities uh, in Belfast City Hall to recognise, I suppose, the, art, the artistic or the literary uh, richness uh, of our city. Uh, so it was a fantastic opportunity for me as First Citizen, as a representative of Belfast City Council, uh, to bring that uh, into the heart of our city here this afternoon, to recognise Patrick Fiek, to recognise the fantastic work uh, and the fantastic reflections that we now have of this city, of our people, of our history, through his work uh, on the edge. Uh, thanks everyone for taking the time to, to come along. I, I know it, it means a lot. Um, it, it, it won't go unnoticed. Uh, I'm very, very uh, much looking forward to reading uh, the book uh, that it was presented of the writings of Pottery Fake. Uh, so that'll, that'll definitely give me uh, some time. I'll be looking stuff to do uh, uh, after June because I don't know what I'm going to do with myself once I'm finished uh, in this job. So I may take up poetry myself, you never know. Uh, but go to uh, and have a good day. And uh, as we say uh, in Irish, la brecha hana. Happy birthday. Thank you. Patrick Fick, you deserve to be celebrated here today. Uh, and this reception, kindly hosted by the Lord Mayor, uh, brings that into effect. At times during a long career, you had nothing but your poetry. You're not a material person. In fact, your worldly belongings could probably be put in two cardboard boxes. And to start that appreciation of your work in poetry, I'm going to call Paddy Scully, local actor, to read two poems. The first one is uh, Standing Water for Brendan Hamill. Punting into Nova Scotia, 19 and 29. Girl, mother's delf face, creaks, cracks. I'm breaking in two myself at five. Good night, all from the beginning. Goodbye, cobblestones. But a back street womb wall won't let me climb over it. We stare at the brick. Halifax sky, a yellow wolf cold, sits on the leaden Atlantic. A new world horizon, old morning, you are the night of life. The Russian Orthodox priest who has a beard is the bogeyman will put me in his bag. Is America the berry hole he'll put me in if I cry? On the tiny, it stops tangoing transoceanic motor ship. Creaks. I cling hard, tight, onto a Belfast flapper's strong wrist bone. Her stiff new red leather raincoat creaks. Children that play in the botanic gardens. There is beneath sea wind a bypath where foxes evade the dawn and young fawns tarry, where the vines of the ever grape still hanging there go unspoiled, uncrunched, unmade into wine. Young children, for all I care, still carry away the store of berry from the Evervine. Here they will grow up and bloom and become and marry and beget 
kept and die and still that by path mine by right of remembering only is open only to them to spoil if they like but they will not they make sweet under the twigs and laurels the whole of the lonely as they beat down the dust of the world with their dancing feet. The plaque will be fixed permanently in the John Hewitt establishment. Uh, he was an old colleague and friend of Bodwick Fakes. I thank very much the management of the John Hewitt for facilitating that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Podrick, as has already been stated, we're here to pay uh, tribute to our guest of honour, Patrick Joseph O'Connor. Um, here today, um, for many, uh, he is a friend, as you've seen from the film, a mentor, a teacher, and of course, an inspiration. Throughout his long career, he's established himself as one of the most distinctive voices of his generation. And in our long and rich tradition of poetry, I think he ranks amongst the best, and his place uh, in Northern Irish literary history is surely assured. Now, that's not to say uh, that Padraig's work has been uh, without its critics. And some of that criticism has been strenuous, as Padraig himself acknowledges in his poem, Glass, Grass, when he says that his fellow poets call his work, in quotes, cryptic, crude, distasteful, brutal, savage, and bitter. As if that were a criticism, I say. And it's precisely, I think, because his honesty and the drive to bear witness to his times is so direct, so unflinching and uncompromising, no matter how hard these things are for us to hear, that as a chronicler of the troubles, he is quite simply, I believe, unsurpassed. His is a raw sensitivity to violence shared by few of his contemporaries. Always an outsider, and never one to fit comfortably within the Northern Irish literary establishment, Podrick Fierke has nonetheless always had his admirers. Muldoon, for instance, uh, has said that Fierke represents something about the condition of being a poet that many, including me, as in himself, shy away from. And Longley has described him as, in quotes, the custodian of the spirit of poetry. I think what poets like Podrick uh, would never countenance uh, in their own work is artistic detachment. His work is rooted in our times, in the troubles. It is engaged with its time, uh, its people, and its events. Moreover, I think it's written in a style which is immediately engaging and accessible to the wider public, the people, the communities that he is speaking to. People, I think, have always been able to get uh, Podrig's poetry. As we know, the backdrop to much of his work was the collapse of the established social order the political violence which set the scene for everything that happened in Northern Ireland, uh, political and sectarian divisions, and the sometimes daily violence of explosions, beatings, and shootings. Podrick's words are simply capable, uh, sorry, are similarly capable of wounding his reader. But his intent, as has been said, was not to perpetuate conflict. Rather, I think he set out to puncture our preconceptions and assumptions to try and shatter them. 
He chronicled the most brutal and shocking of times, and he did so with memorable veracity. It's commonly said uh, that art holds up a mirror to society and that the mirror reveals greater truths. I think that's true of Padraig's poetry. But it's a very particular kind of truth that we're dealing with here. Fergal Keane, uh, no stranger to conflict himself, expresses this well, I think, when he says, truth should be spoken, but it must be the truth of human complexity, compassion and generosity, the truth of pain and love, not the partial truth of the partisan or of the big lie of the demagogue dressed up as truth. The writer has no place in the company of such people or words. Throughout the decades, Podrick has strenuously avoided the company of such people. He has continued, undaunted and unyielding, to plough his own artistic furrow. He has stayed true to his own vision. His work isn't uh, easily defined in terms of the influence of other poets, I think. Rather, his work is always immediately recognisable as his own. And for that reason, I believe that he must be defined in terms of his own aesthetic, an inimitable poetic aesthetic of absolute artistic and human integrity. And it's a real privilege to be in your company today to celebrate your, birth your birthday. Thank you. Luck. A green-breasted titwit by cool of the shore hops. The wren, my favourite, makes nest in the rinsed yew. A trim basket hat lets the rain through. The jaw and chirp on him. You would think our man is on great foray with big doom. The brood and himself gather to eat, grub trapped between tittering feet. A drop of rain would drown the family of them. To think the lapwing plover of crest and crown is rendered chickless, the stone-built nest knocked down. When the wren's whole dozen, neath an oak leaf, they spared the storm, my own, and the plover's grief. Dear Bauman Poet, today is my birthday. I am 17. My hometown has just been blown up. Dead feet and dead faces. Corpses still alight. Students helping kids and old people out of still burning houses. I have nothing to write poems about. This is my 20th century nightlife. To give you a, a flavour of uh, more of Padraig's uh, poetry, Paddy Scully is going to read uh, a few poems. The Boy and the Geese for Bridget. The swans rise up with their wings in day and they fly to the sky like the clouds away. Yet with all their beauty and grace and might, I would rather have geese for their less smooth flight. I would rather have geese for they're ugly like me. Because they are ugly as ugly can be, I would rather have geese for their mystery. Interny. It's not absolutely fair. It's not absolutely wrong and it does not hurt to be jeered at when you're hanging upside down when hanging upside down hurts more i'd like to finish with this one stormbird my comings and goings are the comings and goings of the wind I am the word the wind mutters. Pay me no mind, though I serve beauty and not mankind. The voice 
is the bird of a word wind gives wings to. I am the blackbird of the ruined nest which sings all is beauty to the blind. Porrick Vick, 1997. Jerry Daw from Trinity College Dublin is here with us this evening. Uh, and Jerry has been a long time supporter uh, of Fiex work. So I'd like to ask Jerry Daw to come up to the podium. Uh, delighted to be here to say a few words uh, for Michael uh, and on behalf of uh, Joe. Um, we go back a long way to 1973 and um, it was he that uh, reprimanded me for talking too fast uh, and saying poems too quickly. Um, so I'm going to speak slowly because he's here. <laughs> I thought basically what I'd just try and do is to summarize in uh, five or ten minutes uh, the significance of this uh, great poet. Um, and I use the word great because I believe it and I've always believed it. Um, that he is a, a great poet. Um, it seems to me to be appropriate to, um, given the weekend that we're in, uh, the Titanic weekend, uh, that um, uh, Lord Mayor mentioned the issue of omens, uh, because of course Joe Park Fake uh, is a great poet of omens. And um, from an early stage, he remarked on omens uh, in the, this wonderful, delicate uh, image from a piece of prose that he wrote. There were bad omens, though. I, rem I remember two wee blackbirds getting trapped between the nylon drape and the window and fluttering madly, not able to get out. As I released them, the sky darkened. A shadow came across the window just as they escaped. I'm a poet who believes in omens. Things conspired against us. This is Friday the 13th. And I'll tell you something. It's also the birthday of Samuel Beckett, and it's the birthday of Seamus Heaney. Uh, and uh, Seamus texted me to send on his good wishes to Joe uh, and to wish you well today. Uh, in, uh, for your, your birthday. So, the significance of uh, Porrick Fake. Well, as we've heard uh, from all the other speakers, uh, um, Joe's probably most identified as the chronicler uh, of the Troubles. Uh, and anyone who reads his work sees that so clearly. It's there like a spine running through uh, his imagination. But if you detach the t term troubles and park it for one moment or two, I think what make, makes Joe's work so important today in the 21st century, uh, not looking back to our troubled past, but uh, to where we are today, I think his work explores and exposes the chaotic roots of violence and the damage social violence does to family and civic life, both in his own personal life but also in the life of this society. Joe has charted what happens when violence takes over. I think he does it in a way that no other writer uh, has done, no other Irish writer has done. As those wonderful images uh, of the city and its surroundings, uh, in Michael's uh, short uh, uh, portrait there, visual portrait, Joe is a wonderful, wonderful poet of the city of Belfast, but also we must never forget, it's the point I'm going to come to, uh, to conclude with, of New York. We have amongst us a New York poet as well as a Belfast poet, and Joe's life in New York is inseparable from his life here. I remember reading the early poems like First Movement or Hemorrhage, uh, and literally the door opened on the city of Belfast, um, and it was through Joe's understanding of city life 
uh, uh, that uh, uh, seems to have brought a completely fresh eye to the sounds and the smells and the speech of city life. But having said that, as that little omen uh, 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 poem uh, refers, Joe has and always, always has contained inside his work a bright eye on nature. Um, he may not be a, a poet of nature, but he does write about nature as it's revealed in the city. And that's unusual. Van Morrison is the only uh, writer in this, uh, produced by this society, the city, which seems to contain, uh, to, to have that, possess that kind of sense of the, the natural, the nature, country in the city itself. And as I've already mentioned, there are these wonderful speech rhythms in Joe's work. The street life of this city that's all around us, he conveys it. Um, and uh, as the, uh, the poems that we've heard uh, this morning uh, reveal, he catches how we say what we say so clearly and cleanly. Um, and I think people sometimes miscue this. Uh, Joe is also a great comic. There's a tremendous humor in his work. And I think it's a very strong sense of Belfast humor, which isn't that distant from New York humor as well. Wry, lacerating wit and irony. And uh, Joe has that comic touch in uh, Spade Loads. I also think that one of the things that has always drawn me to Joe's work has been the way in which uh, he reveals the city to itself. The city that I grew up in, that we all have grown up in, um, from the inside out. He doesn't take a kind of uh, a global look down at the city. Uh, he's part of the people and the life that uh, uh, we have all lived here. Um, the big themes of Joe's poetry uh, are, are, are really important and very, very important for this uh, 21st century. The relationship between politics and power and poetry, the three Ps. The language of sectarianism, not just in this society, but how that refl reflects on other uh, uh, social conflicts elsewhere in Europe and other parts of the world. The experience of working class life at a time when workers uh, uh, are under immense pressure financially. It's there in Joe's work. Um, and I think if I was to put on my professorial hat, my literary hat, I would start talking as well about the unique, and I mean unique connection, Porik Fake uh, has between Irish literary traditions like the Celtic revival and American high modernism. Two very distinct literary traditions which Joe uniquely inhabits and links together. But that's best left for another day and another setting. What strikes me most about Joe's poetry, however, um, is the link. And I think we've seen it and heard it this morning. The link uh, he has preserved in his own life, as much as in his writing, between the diaspora, of which he was one uh, a member, going back in the 30s, the Northern Irish generations of men and women who left their homes here for work elsewhere. In Britain, as we know, uh, in, the, in the States and in other countries. Um, and Joe is part of that generation who left. Um, and uh, the sense that he carries into his work is something that I think it's important for us to identify uh, this afternoon because I think it probably is one of Joe's greatest achievements as an artist. He links the reality of migration to the poetic imagination. And he, he does that beyond any other writer of his generation or subsequently. This migrant experience is something that we should be proud of in this city. It's an indelible part of our history from the midpoint of the 18th century and all the way up to those including Joe and subsequent generation uh, who left, uh, but also those who arrived in this country from numerous European countries through to the uh, uh, hundreds of thousands 
who, as I said, have left because they had to as the endless journeying back and forth between these cities of Ireland and Britain and the States. Joe's work is inscribed with that movement, what it means and what it costs. As much as his poetry is open to literary influences from non-Irish sources, to explore in this complex web in Joe's work, I think is the next big step. And the achievement of uh, this morning is to start that momentum rolling, to explore this complex web um, of Joe's poetry and to hand it on to the next generation of readers and students of our literature, both at second level and at third level. I'd like to finish to say that I think it's timely that the Belfast City Council is honouring the poet in Porrick Fake. For too often, I think, for too long, as Rosalind has pointed out, uh, Joe's work has been identified with a particular period of our history, the Troubles. But I think it really is important that we move on from that stage and start to see Joe in a wider frame, and that includes the various points I've mentioned. Thank you very much.